what's the point of an innovation policy without a security policy? Because innovation is not just a matter of, of, of the economy, but a matter of national security. In uh, three weeks ago, the Intercept identified, uh, published a classified document from the NSA saying that basically the future of, of innovation is going to go offshore, to leave America, and that it, it would be in the national interest of the United States to steal other countries' economic secrets and give them to American corporations to maintain an economic advantage for the U.S. Now, what we're talking about here at this conference and what is in fact happening is innovation decentralizing, leaving the Silicon Valley and coming to Latin America. So the question is, how do we protect ourselves from that? And it's not just the U.S. doing it. You have China doing it in even more egregious fashion. So you really aren't paranoid. They really are out to get you. The question is what your threat model is. It depends what you're working on. Yes, uh, yesterday we had a uh, talk from Mike uh, from Vancouver. Mike Volker, there we go. He invested in a company that's researching nuclear fusion. Now, that company is not successful. The day they are successful, if they are successful, how much do you want to bet every intelligence service in the world is going to want to get their hands on that blueprint? And my question is, is that researcher protecting his information from cyber espionage? Somehow I doubt it. Now, the first thing you need to do to protect yourself is to opt out of mass surveillance. The difference between mass surveillance and targeted surveillance is mass surveillance is when the FBI and the NSA suck up every email on the planet and store it in a warehouse in Utah. Targeted surveillance is when a hacker from China or Russia or wherever hacks into your computer and steals your secrets. Opting out of mass surveillance begins and ends with a single word, encryption. Encrypt your emails. Encrypt your phone calls. Encrypt your chats. Encrypt your web traffic. Nothing you send over the wire should be plain text, period. If you're smart enough to start a high-tech startup, you're smart enough to learn how to use PGP. You're smart enough to install Text Secure instead of WhatsApp. You're smart enough to use Red Phone or Jitsi or Signal instead of Skype. And it's not good enough to just encrypt the sensitive stuff. Good OPSEC requires that everything be encrypted. The messages to your girlfriend, the email to your grandmother, encrypted. Give your adversary no way of knowing what traffic is important and what's not. In addition to encryption, consider using Tor. Encryption gives you data privacy, but not metadata privacy. What web pages are you looking at? What research papers are you downloading? Who are you chatting with? Tor anonymizes you on the internet. As an internal NSA PowerPoint slide leaked by Edward Snowden lamented, Tor stinks. And what's bad for the NSA is good for you. Let me repeat a key point here. If you are working on R&D that isn't even remotely interesting, someone somewhere is spying on you. Assume that this person will do anything to get their hands on your blueprints. It, it, there's a saying in computer security. Assume breach. Assume that you have already been hacked and act accordingly. Now let's say you have successfully opted out of mass surveillance. You're encrypting your email. Everything is, is, is now encrypted. How does your adversary respond? They infect your laptop or smartphone or serve it with a virus or trojan. They use a zero-day exploit. Maybe they just use a social engineering attack. You get a funny email with a link to a cat video on YouTube. Boom, you're pwned. Endpoint security is terrible. 40 years of writing computer code has proven that human beings are incapable of writing exploit-free code. Worse, governments around the world have commandeered their local IT manufacturers to backdoor their devices, operating systems, and other products. 
I used to work as a sys sysadmin some years ago now. We used only free and open source software. The joke around the office was, Windows is spyware with an operating system attached. The NSA has backdoor Windows. The Chinese have backdoored Huawei routers. This happens all over the world. American tech is especially vulnerable because Silicon Valley happens to be physically located in the United States. You can't trust your hardware. You can't trust your software. There is no absolute security on their internet. So what do we do? Do we just throw up our hands? Let's just roll over and die. Well, you know, in real life, there's no such thing as perfectly secure house. But we seem to live in them just fine, don't we? Security is not about absoluteness. It is not a binary yes or no question. It's about layers. It's about degrees. Let me ask you this. Do you lock the door to your house when you go out? Sure. Could someone just break the window and steal your TV? Sure. But you still lock the door to your house. So maybe you lock your door and put bars on your windows. So then maybe someone drives a tank through the side of your house. It all depends what you're trying to protect. What's your threat model? Are you building the next social media platform for pet shop owners? Or are you researching a cure for cancer? How bad would someone want your R&D? The same is true for computer security. There are some basic, basic things like locking your front door you have to do if you want to protect your R&D. This is low hanging fruit. And if you aren't taking these basic steps to protect yourself, you are asking for trouble. Number one, friends don't let friends use Windows. I'm sorry, but Windows is a security expert's worst nightmare. If you're doing sensitive R&D on a Windows laptop attached to the internet, I'm sorry, I just I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> That's just, I don't, don't. Number two, strongly reevaluate your use of Apple products. In the words of security expert Bruce Schneier, we must assume all American technology has been commandeered by the NSA and FBI until proven otherwise. And the problem with backdoors like this is that if the NSA has backdoored OS X, then the Chinese are looking for those backdoors to exploit as well. You can't have just a backdoor for one country. If, if, if you put a, 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 a zero-day vulnerability into a piece of software, anyone smart enough to find that vulnerability can use it. Number three, use free software. Your research computer should be running Linux. If you want to get exotic, use OpenBSD or FreeBSD, but you should be running free software on your computer. Is this a guarantee the software is secure? Of course not. But it's a good deal more difficult to slip a back door into free software that's publicly available for download than into proprietary software like Linux. <coughs> Let's suppose you've made all the recommendations I've made thus far. Guess what? You are still pwned. Someone somewhere is monitoring every keystroke you make. What do we do now? We compartmentalize. You should be doing your R&D on an air-gapped machine. You should install Linux. You should install the tools you need to do your work, and then remove the Ethernet and wireless cards. Do local backups encrypted, stored in multiple locations. Take out the sound card and webcam, too. More on that in a minute. Material on an air-gapped machine makes life very difficult for an adversary that wants your data. Not impossible, but very difficult. This gives you the best chance you have to protect yourself. But it's inconvenient. How do you collaboratively develop with other people? How do you get your data onto and off your air gap machine without it being compromised? Let's pause for a quick show of hands. <clears throat> Suppose you're walking down the sidewalk, and you find a bright, new, shiny USB stick, a pen drive. How many of you? Pick up that pen drive and put it in your pocket. How many of you go home and stick that pen drive into your laptop? Now, 
suppose you're walking along the sidewalk and you find a used syringe. There's some blood at the tip, maybe a little bit of leftover heroin in the plunger. How many of you pick up that syringe and stick it in your arm? Not so many. USB sticks are seriously evil. The USB protocol is fundamentally broken. As the Stuxnet worm demonstrated a few years back, USB sticks are an ideal attack vector, not only for delivering destructive payloads capable of sabotage, but also for exfiltration of data, of your data, of your research, of your intellectual property. Classified networks have a basic rule. Transfer data from less secure networks to more secure networks, but not the other way around. Since your threat model as an innovator is to defend against exfiltration of data and not sabotage, then any transfer of data from the air gap machine to the internet must be done with great care. In addition to air gap machines, another option you may like to consider and that I'm using on this laptop here is cubes. Cubes is probably the most secure operating system available today, at least for civilians. It is free software. It is built on the lockdown version of the Zen hypervisor and runs multiple virtual machines to allow you to compartmentalize your data, inclu including the use of non-networked vault VMs. I use it personally and highly recommend it. IndieFone developer Errol Balkin gave a talk last year in which he proclaimed that his smartphone gave him superpowers, that it made him, in effect, a cyborg. The problem is the security of your smartphone is no better than your laptop, and in some ways it's worse. An attacker who phones your smartphone sees what you see, hears what you hear, knows how fast you walk, can trace your movements over the course of time, and notice when you've changed your routine. Your smartphone is the key to your digital life. Only it's a key that any intelligence agency or capable hacker in the world can phone. Consider the following scenario. <clears throat> You're sitting at your air-gapped computer running cubes, working on some sensitive R&D. You've got the cure for cancer in the works. You put your smartphone down next to your computer. But the smartphone can record the sound of your keystrokes. New research shows that it is possible to build a keylogger based on the sound of your keystrokes. And if university research has reached this conclusion, we can be sure the intelligence agencies of multiple nations have already developed this capability. Smartphones are great, don't get me wrong, but you cannot trust them with anything sensitive. So maybe you've got your air gap machine, your smartphone goes in the fridge, or it doesn't come to work. You've got your OPSEC under control. But what's your threat model? How bad does your adversary want your data? Do you have the cure for cancer? Do you have something really interesting and juicy? Something that's not an idea, not a, blue, uh, not a prototype, but actual blueprints that actually work. Ever heard of Tempest? Tempest is the US military code name for electromagnetic attacks. It has been known for decades that computer screens give off EMF radiation, and that radiation can easily be used to record all your on-screen activity. Is there a van parked across the street from your office, or a car with heavily tinted windows? Tempest attacks can be done using equipment no larger than a suitcase. The defense against Tempest attacks is to build a Faraday cage in your office to prevent EMF radiation from leaving your secure work environment. How many of you have Faraday cages installed in your co-working space? Now let's talk about bad BIOS. Bad BIOS is a virus that infects computers not via the internet, but via your sound card and microphone. The virus plays a high frequency audio signal that any laptop whose microphone is within hearing range can pick up. The virus embeds itself in your firmware BIOS and researchers who have studied the malware say that once infected, it is impossible to get rid of. The defense against bad BIOS is to remove your sound card and microphone. Again, what's your threat model? How bad would a hacker or foreign government want to get their hands on your R&D? You have to customize your OPSEC for your adversary. 
So now you're sitting in your underground bunker, surrounded by your Faraday cage, your smartphone is in the fridge, and you're finally safe, right? Now you can innovate. But wait, remember your adversaries. Intelligence agency is just a fancy word for spies. And spies are criminals. That's what they do. Spies are paid to break and enter, to tamper and commit sabotage, sometimes even to murder people. That's what these people do for a living. If the Chinese or the Americans or the Russians really want to know what's on your laptop, how much you want to bet they won't just break into your office and steal it, steal your server even. Or if they don't want to spook you, maybe they install hidden cameras to record all your keystrokes, record all your conversations. Or they install an implant in your air gap machine that transmits your data to their command and control server. You don't order any of your equipment online, I hope, right? So the lesson here is simple. Digital OPSEC must be complemented by good physical security. And the more valuable your innovation, the more valuable your research, the more attention you must pay to physical security. At this point, you're probably thinking, there's no way I can do all that. If I did, I would never have time to, you know, innovate. I would never make any money to pay my bills. What am I supposed to do? We are entering an age of digital feudalism because the fundamental truth of the internet is that attack is cheap and defense is hard. Some might say impossible. Who will protect you from the marauders who would steal your, your blueprints and leave you with nothing? We are here today to ask the question, how can we promote innovation in Latin America? Governments from Chile to Brazil to Mexico are throwing money at startups in the hope that they will create something great, something to create jobs, to supercharge the local economy, maybe even change the world. But it's not enough to just promote innovation. What is the point of cultivating great R&D only for the Chinese or the Americans or the Russians to steal those innovations? Latin American governments must also offer startups protection. Innovation is not just a matter of the economy. As the NSA itself has identified, innovation is a matter of national security. If your government is serious about developing a startup ecosystem, then they also need to get serious about protecting that ecosystem from industrial espionage. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I may, I may have missed the first part of uh, your session, so, you, so maybe you introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's your background? I am a software developer, a journalist, and most recently a conference organizer. Great. Um, and in that context, uh, where does your knowledge come from uh, in, in the arena of security? As a software developer and a journalist who reports on computer security issues for publications such as The Economist. Okay, thanks. Very interesting. Anyone else? Yes. In the context of intellectual property. Mm. In the context of intellectual property, I, I may I did miss the first part of your presentation. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, one of the weaknesses we see is the protection and real development of significant. IP, mm -hmm. and there's an argument for IP, and there's also an argument against IP. Um, for the entrepreneurs in the room, one of the arguments against IP mm -hmm. is that if you patent something, you have to be prepared to defend it. And if a large multinational pirates your technology, mm. most times, entrepreneurs don't have the wherewithal to properly defend it. Absolutely. But on the other hand, the argument for IP is that a lot of investors won't invest in your company without some form of intellectual capital. Mm. 
whether it be products, copyrights, trademarks, etc. Mm -hmm. So here in Latin America, what is the position on intellectual property protection, globalization, mm -hmm. and defense? Well, I am not a lawyer, a um, and I'm surely not an intellectual property lawyer. So that, that is an excellent question, but one I'm not prepared to answer today. My personal opinion is that limited protection for intellectual property is necessary to stimulate R&D. Why would you invent something if there is no economic protection uh, to take advantage of that R&D? Why would you bother to go, to go to the trouble? But you can sell it. You can sell your product just not without. You can sell your product just not without maybe the formal forms of IP which become obsolete very quickly nowadays. Well, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, again, the emphasis of, of this talk is, is about computer security, not the, the legal issues surrounding intellectual property, uh, because I know a great deal about computer security and relatively little about international IP law. So it would be, um, I think, unwise to comment on the field I know relatively little about. I, I think the, the end point of what I'm getting at is that um, in many real ways, we, our lives have moved. I think it was Julian Assange a few months ago who pointed out, you know, it used to be we, we lived in the real world and we went online. But now, in a very real way, we live our lives online and visit the real world. But the problem is that the security implications of that are genuinely frightening because attack is cheap and defense is nearly impossible. And power corrupts. And when it centralizes, it corrupts even further. And if we want to promote genuine R&D, like really, in it, like, like take, let's take clean tech or green tech, for instance. I mean, we're not talking, you know, software as a service. We're talking about really hardcore laboratory R&D doing this is a new thing that never existed before that's good for mankind. Now, I guarantee you that every major intelligence agency in the world has a department of economic espionage that wants to know about your blueprints the very day you text your wife, honey, we're going to celebrate. I just made the cure for cancer. You know, and um, China is very blatant about this. They just don't give a damn. But the U.S. is doing it too, as um, The Intercept published just a few weeks ago, and it's planning to do even more. So it's not like the U.S. is somehow uh, immune from this. Every major, even Brazil, I'm sure, every major government in the world is doing this. So, and that has major implications for the future of innovation, because the whole point of intellectual property is, I'm going to invent something new, and I will be financially rewarded for my high risk activity and for my financial investment. But if it is impossible for me to do R&D and take advantage of that IP because another country is just going to steal it and run me out of business, then why should I engage in R&D? I mean, entrepreneurs and investors work to make money. It's not the only reason they work, but without the financial incentive, you know, People don't work for free. Does it answer your question? No. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I have another question. Sure. Yes, Fabian, Fabian. Um, Please. By overprotecting yourself, are you not becoming a target? Because a person that has nothing to hide can potentially not be a target. I mean, how do you become a target of a uh, potential attack? Okay, well, I mean, it, it, it's pretty... Suppose I'm working on a cure for cancer. I have a PhD in cancer research from Johns Hopkins, and I'm working in a lab in Maryland. It's not like I'm in hiding. I'm not Osama bin Laden, you know? I mean, it, w w the, my research into cancer cells is published in medical journals. Everyone knows what I'm working on. It's not like it's a secret. You know, so it, it's, it becomes a trivial matter 
for, I mean, it's open source research. It's not even cyber hacking. It's just, you know, let's open today's medical journal and see who's working on cancer research. Who's got something interesting? Let's tap their phone. Let's hack their computer. If they come with something interesting, we'll, we'll steal it. I mean, this is all automated. It, it doesn't take a lot of effort to do this or a lot of man hours, you know? I mean, you can monitor 10,000, 100,000 people automatically for a trivial amount of effort. Software scales in a lot of bad ways, too. Last question, we, we gotta move. All right, thanks. Um, my question is regarding um, the way, if, if there's any way to track whether you've been hacked or not. Like, once it happens, do you know, are mm -hmm. you able like to understand whether the, the, this hacker has been in your computer or, or you just assume that it has because he's got information that, that you have uh, on your computer? That's a good, very good question. Uh, one of the intellectual conundrums of c computer security is that there are known unknowns. We know there are zero days. How many zero days are there? In what operating systems are those zero days? It's a known unknown. Security experts say, assume breach, compartmentalize. Assume you've been hacked, because you have to assume you've been hacked, and then act accordingly. It's a very odd way of thinking. It's a very difficult to, to change the mentality because until, until our lives moved online in the last 12 to 18 months, security was physical. I have my castle wall. The enemy is without. I am within. If they come in, I will see them inside my castle and I will probably die. Whereas computer security is, they can be everywhere like ghosts and in control of everything and you have no idea, which is a very unintuitive way of thinking about the world, which makes it very difficult to explain computer security to people who are not technical. Thank you very much. <laughs>